Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome Peter O'Shea, Head of Corporate and Regulatory Affairs at ESB, and Karen O'Regan, Head of Accenture Strategy Ireland, uh, and who also leads our work at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for being here today. You're very welcome, and thanks for taking the time to Not join us. Mm -hmm. We're here to continue the discussion on sustainability, which our young reporters have just spoken so eloquently about. Um, Peter, if I may start with you. ESB has announced some ambitious plans to commit to a science-based target by 2030 and to achieve net zero by 2040. What does that mean in terms of the workforce required to deliver on that ambition? And do you think there might be opportunity to bring maybe more female talent into the sector? I think without doubt now, and I'd like the CVs of all the kids who did a piece <laughs> earlier on. Yeah. Um, Line them up for interview. Yeah, look, we, we launched our new strategy last Monday, two weeks. It was actually in the National Concert Hall um, here in Dublin. And, you know, like the strategy is really important for ESB. It's really important for Ireland Inc. And we, we opened our presentation of it with um, uh, Alicia O'Sullivan. Alicia is, is a, an ambassador for UCC. She went to uh, COP26 last November. And we asked her to just explain from her generation what net zero, why net zero is important. And it set a really good context. And we're also joined then by Eamon Ryan, um, our minister. And um, he, he sat in on, our, on the Q&A and we did a panel discussion. But I suppose when you look at the strategy, uh, there's three major pillars to what, what, what we want to do. And the first is really about decarbonizing electricity. Um, and that, that means, from the ESP perspective, moving from 1,000 megawatts of, of uh, renewable electricity right now to 5,000 by 2030. But it means much more than that. It means that you know, all of the other generators in the marketplace, they'll want to connect probably double the amount of wind that's currently on the system to the system in the next, in the next 10, 15 years by, by 2030. So it's a massive undertaking in terms of investment. Um, we'll be investing probably between one and 1.5 billion a year um, over the course of the strategy. So that's the first, the first major, major pillar. The second major pillar then is around reliant, reliable and resilient infrastructure. Um, and that's becoming increasingly important because wind and, and solar are like they're, they're intermittent sources of energy. So we actually need to have storage capability on the system to deal with the, the, the point in time when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. So a major investment then in networks, in smart networks to enable that, but also in storage. And look, when we look a little bit beyond 2030, we're looking at things like hydrogen and what hydrogen will mean on the Irish system. And I suppose when, when, we, when we then put all those together, um, you know, and we're good at doing that big, chunky engineering piece, um, but then you've got to look at the customers. And how do we actually empower customers um, to do their part of delivering on the transition? So they're the, they're the three big things that, that we're doing. I suppose underpinning that then, some foundational capabilities that, that we've agreed. Clearly, we have to be strong financially to be able to, to, be able to do this. Um, we have to recognize that data is disrupting our sector and our business, and we have to be able to work with that. Um, and there's a whole set of skill sets then we need to supplement on that. Um, and we've got to empower people. You know, we've got to empower people. We've got to, to bring the best that we have, bring them together in a diverse and inclusive way to get the most out, out of people so we can deliver on that strategy. Thank you. Listening to your story and to those important factors, Karen, is there any advice that you could give to organisations if they think about setting their own science-based targets, just based on the work you're leading at Accenture, but also with our clients? Yeah, Niamh. And I'd like to congratulate Peter and ESB on such an amazing strategy as well last week. I think what we would say is you know, you've got to start. You've got to start measuring and reporting and disclosing. And, and if you don't start, you're going to be required to start pretty soon anyway. I think, you know, Accenture, we have our own science-based targets. Yep. We're very vocal in the market that if you, if you don't have a science-based target, you don't really have a target. We mentioned that at COP26. But I think in the context of today and the fact that we're here celebrating International Women's Day, I think it goes beyond just science-based targets. We need to think of the broader ESG picture around sustainability. And while science-based targets are so important around the E side of that, the environmental aspect, yeah. I think there's also the social and the governance pillars, which are really, really important. And if I think of the inclusion and diversity aspect of those in particular, you know, on the social governance or the social side, we are being required to look at and measure companies in relation to do they promote LGBTQ plus and other diversity. For governance, you know, do the companies promote diversity at the board level? So we're required now to look at these. We know from all the research that we have that companies that perform higher in terms of their ESG rating yeah. perform better financially. So the business case is there and, and we're going to have to do this in the future. 
And actually just building on that, Karen, and a great point you've made around sustainability driving value. If I think back to ESB, Peter, um, you know, ESB has such a strong legacy in Ireland in terms of leading out on change and um, creating a, a great society for Ireland. Anything from bringing electricity to rural Ireland in the 30s and 40s to creating an infrastructure to charge our cars. Um, but if we think about the future energy transition changes ahead, how will that deliver value for our society? Yeah, and look, at one of our mantras um, has always been to decarbonise electricity and to electrify heat and transport. I hope you've heard that somewhere out there from us, yeah. um, because we've been saying it for probably the last seven, eight, nine years. And the whole idea behind that is science, right? So if you actually look at Ireland's emissions right now, you know, this year, last year, the last couple of years, we emit around 60 million tonnes of greenhouse gases each year, broadly. And about a third of that is from agriculture. And the rest of our emissions divides broadly into three categories. It is how we generate electricity, mm -hmm. it's how we move ourselves and our goods across the country in transport, and it's how we use heat, process heat in industry, but heat in our buildings as well. And it's broadly a, a third, a third, a third of that remaining two thirds. So our idea is that if we can decarbonize electricity, and we're making great efforts in that, we're 40% of all of our electricity last year was, was from wind and solar and hydro. So if we can decarbonize electricity, then use those clean sources to power the heat in the transport sectors, well then no longer are we dealing with a small amount of our emissions through electricity, you're actually dealing with the vast majority of them, yeah. uh, the vast majority of our emissions. So when, when, when we look at that, that's how, that's how we, that, that, that was our mantra, and I suppose a piece of work we did with Accenture over the last, um, certainly over the last 12, 18 months, I see Catherine has just joined us as well, um, is around the, 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 uh, the, the system value framework. Um, and what it tries to do is put more science to that simple mantra. Right, so looking at the different benefits uh, that would arise from you know, decarbonising the, the sector. Benefits like jobs, which are really important. Benefits like health benefits. You know, imagine a world where there's no tailpipe in the back of cars, where there's no chimneys on top of houses, where electricity comes from wind and solar. You know, that's a much better world than the one we have right now. And like right now, Ireland has the fourth highest level of asthma in the, across the globe, which is astounding, really. So I think the sort of benefits that the system value framework would allow us to, to understand, they, they help us understand that and help us then, I suppose, to create our own advocacy plans to government and to, to ensure that we all sort of have a reasonable, solid understanding of the maths behind where we're going. Just building on the system value framework, Karen, could you talk us a little bit more about the work that Accenture has done with the World Economic Forum? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess we've been working now with the World Economic Forum for a number of years and behind it is, I guess it's based on the premise of this concept of collaborative action. I think it was mentioned earlier how we can come together across industries across the world really to bring about positive societal impact. So all the work we do has that at the heart of it. Um, as Peter mentioned, you know, we do a huge amount of work in the energy transition space, looking at those net zero pathways right across all industries. You know, our, our projects focus on things like how how do we think around what the net zero carbon cities of the future are going to look like? Um, what is a circular car? You know, what's the concept of a car that has no waste? How do we accelerate and scale up clean hydrogen mm -hmm. as a source for the future? So we do a huge amount there, but actually more broadly than that, we work across other industries as well. And again, if I think of International Women's Day, a lot of that work has the concept of inclusion, equality and diversity at its core. Um, we're about to launch some research this week just to coincide with International Women's Day, where we look at, looked at representation across the media and entertainment industry. And we chose that industry to start with the World Economic Forum because if you think of the outsized impact it has on consumers, the reach, you know, the media and entertainment sector has such a powerful and can be such a powerful force in, I guess, shaping perceptions um, through content. And all of that content is sharing kind of lived experiences, looking at race, uh, looking at gender, looking at ability, age, uh, and many other factors. So we need the people that are in that industry at leadership um, and all other levels to be really diverse, to be able to create the content that actually shows the equality in the world that we want to be. Thank you. It's a shame to have to finish the discussion. Thank you both for sharing your ideas and your perspectives. What a fitting way to, to end. Good luck to ESB on their advocacy as well as your energy transition changes. Uh, both, as you say, are, are critical. And now it's back to the concert hall where Aileen is standing by.